another burial in Delany. Delany, in the Slavic language, means where the river flows. The community always used to be called Fort Franklin. Now it's become known as the Village of Widows. My dad died of cancer. My aunt died of cancer. My grandmother died of cancer. My mom is suffering because of her sickness. And like, what about my children? Because I still believe that once there's something in a person's genes, it carries on. In my family, we're really hit by cancer or bone disease. It's like, um, I, there's a lot of things I want to say, but it is, it, like, it's can't, you know, talk about it. Their survival as a society is at question because the young men are floundering. They don't have grandfathers, fathers, uncles to, to help them face this confusing world. It's a deep wound. derelict freighter, the Radium Gilbert, carried the uranium ore that went into the bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The Gilbert sits within plain view of the community, a sad reminder of the two generations of men from Delaunay who worked for the mine that shook the world. The El Dorado mine was on the remote shores of Great Bear Lake, on the Arctic Circle, in Canada's Northwest Territories. The ore was barged from Port Radium in Echo Bay down the Great Bear River at Delaunay. One industrial development and the Dene of the Satu region were flung across the ages into the atomic age. It was only two years ago that the community learned that 1.7 million tons of radioactive mine waste or tailings was still scattered around the old mine site. One million tons of these tailings in the lake. Tailings, the scientists say, will remain harmful to man and the creatures of this land for the next 800,000 years. When they discovered the ore at Port Radium, which was then sent down south, and they made a bomb from it, and destroyed all those many lives in Japan. We weren't even aware about that, even though it came from our land. We Dene people are good people, and we don't want them to think it was our fault. I'm sorry for them, and I want to send my respects. I really hope that blame won't be put on us because we had no knowledge about all what happened in the war. It's a justice issue for them on many, many, many levels. They have to make amends of some kind. So they have to go to the surviving relatives of the Japanese people and say, this is the way it happened. And in telling that story, they heal themselves. 
to put together these two people, the first ore carriers of the uranium that went into the bomb, with the first people on whom uh, an atomic bomb was dropped. The beginning is meeting the end. The prophet said in the future, after that mine closed down, things were going to change for the worse. He said there will be many hardships because of those rocks, and the people are going to suffer. In 1930, prospector Gilbert Labine discovered pitchblende and silver ore on the rocky shore of Great Bear Lake. He staked his claim. Out of these bare rocks, they mined pitchblende ore containing radium so rare it is valued at $700,000 an ounce. Pitchblende is highly radioactive. It contains both radium and uranium. The market for uranium came later with the desire to make atomic bombs. But radium in the 1930s was the miracle cancer cure, more valued than gold. Nobody knew uranium, what it is. They didn't know it was a dangerous, uh, dangerous rock. And when they heard a mine was there, oh, they were all got excited. And the mine was able to buy meat from the Indian. And the woman could sell moccasin, mucklucks, mitts. And the ore they were shipping, they were using Indian laborers to load the bars, load the trucks. If you look at the medical literature of the day, scientists had acknowledged that uranium mining came, or, or radium mining came with a number of hazards, especially to, to exposure to gamma rays and also ex exposure to radon gases. And they knew the health consequences of that. They knew that, uh, particularly from the European experience, uh, were miners who had worked in mines where there were really high levels of radon and radioactivity had died of lung cancer. So we shouldn't be surprised then when we find that many of the Denny who worked on this project also died of lung cancer. In the early 1930s, the Canadian mines conducted blood tests on the miners at Great Bear Lake, and they found that the blood counts of these men were altered. Since the earliest days of the fur trade, the Dene had carried the sacks of commerce up and down the river supply routes of the Northwest. I worked on the boat, the Radium Gilbert, for a long time, coming from Port Radium to across from here and down the river. What we would do was unload the ore across at the landing and load it onto a barge that went down to the rapids. Then we would unload it and load it onto a truck, take it over to the other side, then unload it again and load it again on a barge. These bags were really heavy. We'd work one day. It was almost like we got worn right down. A lot of times the bags would leak. The ore was like very fine sand. It would leak all over our bodies. Sometimes, lots would leak out. We used wheelbarrows to haul broken bags and transport them in boxes. If they were spilled, we would clean it up as good as we can. But still, it was very hard to pick up every spill. Every place it was handled, there were spills. 
all along Bear River to Fort Norman. Even on the boat. If there were broken bags and the ore dust would spill out, we would just shovel the oars over the side into the water. We always used to wonder what this ore was and why they were hauling it. When I was working hauling those bags, I'd sometimes carry small change in my pockets. And after quitting time, if, if you took out your change, the radium must be able to penetrate your clothes because all your silver coins would be black as this mug. To Huey Ferdinand's dad, he wanted a tent made for him, so the people from the mines gave him a box full of these old used sacks. I sewed them together, then cut them out, and that is how I made the tents for us. When we proceeded to detread them, I could see small particles like sand dropping from them as we were ripping them open. I didn't think nothing of it, but now I think about it. Of all the ones who live in those tents, I'm the only one that's alive today. The war against Hitler had reached a critical stage. Physicists in Berlin, in London, in Washington, now understood that splitting of the uranium atom could lead to a bomb of massive destructive power. The race to build the first atomic bomb had already begun. It was at this point that the El Dorado Mining Company changed hands. The Canadian government secretly took control of the mine and the company's refinery at Port Hope, the only uranium refinery in North America. From 1942, all the ore mined at Great Bear Lake and refined at Port Hope went directly to the Manhattan Project to make an atomic bomb. With this terrible new weapon, humanity had somehow learned how to steal the fire from the heavens. The destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki brought victory over Japan. But humankind has lived under this terrible specter ever since. 24 hours after Hiroshima, Stalin gave the order to build a Soviet atomic bomb. Ironically, with uranium ore that came from Great Bear Lake. Now the big threat came from Moscow. Up to the mine closing in 1960, every ounce of ore that came out of the ground was sold to the American military for bombs. I wasn't at all surprised that the Dene were treated the way they were, that they, weren't, they were told nothing. Um, they were simply um, enrolled to be coolies for, for, for this mine. What surprised me was that the government treated both the Dene and its white miners with equal disregard. The white miners had no more information about the health hazards of what they were doing than the Dene ever got. And both groups were essentially written off. Ron and Derek are both suffering from serious illnesses related to radiation poisoning. They both went to school at Port Radium in the early 50s. It would seem that even the middle management shared an astounding lack of knowledge over the radiation hazards at the site. Derek's father was the mine superintendent. Um, my dad built a, um, a sandbox for the kids so we could have something to do on recess in school, so but there's no sand up there. So we use tailings instead. 
<laughs> with a highly reactive. <laughs> That's what they fill the sandbox. Yeah, we were playing in our sandbox <laughs> in the school. When the kids played, yeah, babies, and, and I remember my uh, stepbrother and sister, and they were just toddlers playing in that, you know, but with the their cars and all that. But it's just like flour. It's, uh, it is, because it comes out of the ball mill, and, uh, and it's just yeah. pulverized it's a washing. to nothing, and uh, it, it, just, it just blows around, just like a, a bag of flour would if you left it outside in the wind. It's gone. There was clouds of the stuff blown all over oh, the yeah. camp. You know? It was everywhere. It was yeah. in every room of your house. It was in your cupboards. It was in your bed. It was everywhere. In the terms of the health standards of the time, the health hazards that were understood, say around 1950 or 1955, uh, that measures were taken <coughs> at the refinery and at the mine. I don't think the ones at the mine were perfect. Uh, and I'm not sure if people at the time thought they were perfect or not, but certainly there was, uh, there was a real problem, and they tried to address it. I've never seen anything that would indicate that they addressed the transportation question. In those days, when we were working down at the rapids, all the men working there had their families with them. There would be lots of children around. It's true. We had our tent set up right on the spot where they used to stockpile all those bags. We raised our young children there. We spent seven summers there. The men carrying that ore used the same clothes every day, and after they finished work, they would come home and take off their clothes right inside the tent and then eat. I really do believe that cancer is caused by that ore. I myself had cancer in my kidney, which was taken out. I had seven children, and four of them died, plus my wife, and they all died of cancer. And I have spent 15 years right in front of Echo Bay Mine, and I have my fishnet right in front. And my dad lost three children, not only, that's only two family, my dad and me. And almost all the family from Great Bear Lake have lived, lived close to Echo Bay Mine that lost half of their children. And you don't have to be very educated to know that it possibly affects from uranium, that they throw in the water and that affect our life. It's a long boat ride from Delaney to Port Radium. Leading the Denny guides are Joe Blondin and Huey Ferdinand. They are taking the photographer Robert Daltradici across to explore the old mine site. Joe and Huey were both raised at Port Radium. Both had their families decimated with cancer. My dad first men died in cancer. And my two brothers, and my mom, and my stepmom. But three years ago, my brother died in cancer too. Oh, the monument of that. Uh, yeah, this used to be an island, eh? Now they. They fell at uh, right over the tailings there. So now you gotta have a road there, He's all the way on the hill. A thick blanket of crushed rock and gravel was spread across the site in a government cleanup over 20 years ago. But nothing's ever been done with the million tons of tailings discharged into the lake. Rocket.
lot of pipes. I mean, a lot of steel. Yeah. Yeah. A, lot of, a lot of steel pipes sticking out on the bottom. Robert is well known for his crusading documentary photography on the nuclear industry. Forty times. Forty times background. He plans to mount a major photo exhibition on Delaunay in Hiroshima, Japan. I'm not sure I want to go up there, but um, it's just beginning here, right? You need to realize that no level of radiation is safe, especially if you get it into your system. Okay, so it's hot. It's very hot right over there. More core samples. I get worried when it gets past 50 and to 100, but the industry will tell you that's so low, it, it's no problem. Whoa, 45. 50, off the scale, 100. This here's a uh, caribou tracks right here. Yeah, right here, here, here. So they migrate through here. Yeah, caribou. Right yeah. through the island there. Yeah, right through the island there. Mm. Well, there's thousands of caribou, eh? Lots. You should never tamper with that stuff. It's like uh, taking an orange peel off, and now you have everything exposed, eh? Exposed. Caribou migrate through the port radium area in the fall, and then they come back through in the spring. They feed off the lichens and drink from the lake, and the young ones the same. It's been an important area for Dene people for thousands of years. Now we hear about the effects of that ore. We don't like to go there now, it's too dangerous. But the animals that live off the land, they don't know about the danger of that place. It will be difficult to measure the effects of port radium on the migrating caribou. The Arctic acts as a sink for airborne pollutants of every kind. Radion nuclides are high in the caribou right across the north. What we're doing right now, it's always we need our an animals. We don't want to spoil our animals, that's why we're talking about the uranium now. Sharing is the foundation of Dene Law. Sharing has always meant survival on the tree line. The meat will be taken back to the community and shared amongst the widows and neighbors. People are literally afraid of their own sustenance. There, there, there's fear of their own lands. There's fear of the, and they don't know what the contaminant levels are. And, uh, and that's a bad way to live. Scientific research today hasn't really met hasn't really answered our questions because it doesn't, it doesn't answer the questions of, of the period of exposure that our people have through their environment and through what they eat on a daily basis. And we don't know whether, how much exposure we have because of our diet. We don't know how much exposure we have. 
from that time to today. We don't know how, how much we've actually been exposed to, but we know that it's something that we need to know, and it's something that needs to be addressed in terms of what actually is going to happen with the tailings. The 1994 government report also identified contaminated hotspots across their land. The community has really been galvanized to do something. The Delaunay Uranium Community, after months of research and consultations and community hearings, have distilled the people's health and environmental concerns into 14 points. Cindy is traveling to Ottawa. In a week's time, there are plans for a delegation from Delaunay to meet with three key cabinet ministers for the Department of Indian and Northern Affairs, Public Health, and the Department for Energy and Mines to discuss a line of action. Mr. Speaker, on March the 20th, the story broke in the Calgary Herald about the government's responsibility for radiation death and sickness in the Dene community of Delaunay. Mr. Speaker, a gentleman diagnosed with bone and lung cancer last week has just died. 72 hours before the meeting, Cindy learns that the rest of the delegation is stranded in Yellowknife, 3,000 miles away. Their plane tickets have been issued by the Department of Indian Affairs, but not authorized. No one in the delegation has the cash or a visa card to purchase fresh tickets. I don't think we're, we're asking for anything more than honorable way of dealing with the situation. And uh, we, we have dealt with them honorably and they have tried to tie us up in the bureaucracy. And I think this nickel and diming is a way of making them give up and go home. Forty-eight hours before the meeting, Gina Bea flies in from Delaunay. Gina has got her own visa card. This would be, if it were to happen, this would be a historical moment because this would have been our first meeting with, with ministers. It's never happened before. We've never got even an acknowledgement by even the local bureaucrats back home. So this would have been major for us and um, Unfor uh, um, unfortunately, the rest of our delegation, I'm, you know, I know that two of our other delegation is going to be attending the one in Yellowknife. The arrangements have not been made for them, so they can't travel here. It's the morning of the big meeting. The Dene lawyers have arranged for Joe and Elder Paul Baton to fly in on the overnight red eye. <laughs> You have to do something. We lost all our family. Mm -hmm. Every one of them, frankly. Mm -hmm. Okay, they're trying to get you so tired mm -hmm. and so frustrated and so unhappy that you just go back and you just give up. Okay? They're trying to put that squeeze on Murray and me by not giving us an air ticket to come. Okay? Not only have we paid for our own air tickets, but on the weekend I paid for the tickets on my... I paid for the tickets for the other people to try and come because the government screwed that up, okay? They're putting a squeeze on time, a squeeze on money, a squeeze on the help you need, and they're hoping you will give up. What they're saying when they say that talk was prepared by your lawyers is they're saying these people here are not telling us the truth when they wrote this letter. I find that's not respectful. And it's funny, when the government says the Aboriginal people always bring us oral history, we can't believe oral history. Then when you bring them written history, they say we can't believe it's written down because we know Paul Baton can't write, so it can't be the truth. We want the oral words. Mm -hmm. That's a terrible thing to do. And that's what they're doing to us now. This is the first time that our efforts have been united in doing this as a community mm -hmm. and without influence from outside, mm -hmm. even from, you know, mm -hmm. your input was not really put into that. It was our words. You facilitated. This is what we want. Mm -hmm. Empowerment and all these programs have facilitated. Supposedly that's what it's all about. So that Aboriginal peoples will say what it is they want and governments will assist them. This is like a law book now. I gotta stick with what it says in here and uh, <laughs> like you, you said that we don't know why they want a story and because our stories 
implemented already. Everything's in here. This is what uh, we've been talking about all these years. And uh, just gonna stick with this. go through the south, go through the side egg entrance, it's much easier to get there that way. We were, we were phoned during the meeting and told 160 South. And they said it's a room full of Aboriginal art, which looks to me as though... Yes, 160 South Center. I'm Jane Stewart. Cindy Gelding. This Sorry. is yeah. Elder uh, Paul Baton. He's a traditional chief. Pleased to meet you, Chief. Yes. yes. Jane Stewart, a um, Indian Affairs Squad all the way. Yes. And this is um, Joe Blondin Jr. Pleased to meet you, Joe. Yeah. expressions of sympathy in the six months since the Ottawa meeting there has been very little progress on any of the community's 14 points There's a remarkable grassroots revival of traditional Dene values taking place in Delaunay. The Satu Dene have turned to the teachings of their great prophet from the past, Vetsio Eya, seeking spiritual help to make it into the future. Prophet Eya said, this is the place that you're going to go later on in the future when wrongs are happening, people are suffering. You come to my house and, and you will have fish and you will have nourishment. You will have the ability to heal yourself. Today, when the people speak of the grandfather, they are speaking of Ezio Eya, the spiritual grandfather of Delaunay. Tradition is slowly fading away, and now they start to come back. And that the elder talk about it, they rebuild this old private house. They keep that uh, traditional life, not just for traditional life, but to deal to deal with your your anger to deal with your grieving and all the things we need to, to deal to work from the inside out as one way, as one way of your get ready of your grieving. It's like a whole new religion. And, and so what is happening now is a lot of the widows are saying, well, the grandfather said this. But there's a whole ritual and culture uh, building around what is a big hole in, in Delaunay. And this grandfather's philosophies and teachings seems to be getting a lot more into sort of a religious observance 
uh, than at any other time. It's almost like the ghost dance, you know, of, of, of the U.S. Indians. To us, the land and the resources and everything is very sacred because of the fact that we rely on it to continue to live. And that very source is what actually caused damage to you know, the people. It, it's very hard to comprehend. People here, I think, basically want to make amends and be able to acknowledge that this actually happened. And yet, at the same time, we acknowledge that something as, as, as sacred as that that came from the land could be just as harmful. When you go to a foreign land or a foreign country, you're supposed to pay, pay homage because it's not, it's a, some, it, it's a totally different area. It's just a sign of respect and uh, you have to give something back in return and just to say thank you for having like a, a, a safe travel so far and also asking for a safe travel back to our homeland. This past August, a small delegation from Delaney took a spiritual journey to Hiroshima to attend the peace ceremonies on the anniversary of the bombing. Hiroshima, the city on the water, has been described as a city divided in two, those who can never really know and those who can never ever forget. It was 53 years ago, August 6th, 1945. In the gathering heat of the morning, the earth shook to an explosion never before equaled. The flame of peace will burn for as long as there are nuclear weapons on Earth. There are over 30,000 nuclear warheads stockpiled around the globe, with the terrifying combined firepower of 500,000 Hiroshima bombs. There are over 200,000 names contained in the stone coffin. Every year, on the Day of Remembrance, the names of the A-bomb victims, the Hibaksha, who have died in the last 12 months, their names are added to the list and remembered. The terrible legacy of Hiroshima will live long into the future, in the human genes. We now understand that radiation damage can skip generations. toward Hiroshima, which the navigator hit right on the button. The bombardier took over, identified the target, and everything went with perfection not approached in the rehearsals.
that everything was a success. So we turned around to take a look at it. The sight that greeted our eyes was quite uh, beyond what we had expected because we saw this cloud of boiling dust and debris below us with this tremendous mushroom on top. Uh, beneath that was hidden the ruins of the city of Hiroshima. Whenever you hear about Hiroshima, whatever terrible, horrifying stories you hear, all of it happened. It is not only as an Aboriginal person, a Dene from Delaney, I take on a personal responsibility for what's happened here, but also what is present now, because it was the Canadian government that helped to contribute to what we are now facing in India and Pakistan. And when, when I was a young woman in university, I protested against atomic bomb explosions testing off the coast of Alaska because I never ever wanted to see my daughter face this day, but she is now. I was a junior student in Alaska. So it's with gratefulness to all of you for holding up the shining light on a global level for all the rest of us to follow. And, and, and I hope that this first visit will become a pilgrimage uh, for peace from our people and that we will continue working together and praying together for peace. This small hospital in the back streets of Hiroshima is dedicated to the treatment of Korean abaksha. All told, there were 30,000 Korean forced laborers exposed to the A bomb in Hiroshima. For these Korean abaksha, the hospital is a ray of hope. Their sickness is linked directly to radiation exposure, the atomic plague. We come in here to learn. We heard about the problem of a bomb, which people have really suffered. We, as an Indian, we share your sorrow, our sorrow, and we share that together. I am part of you. I, Indian law goes like that. There's no stranger in the world. Everybody is your brother and sister, and as an Indian, we love each, each other. So therefore, I love you people, and I see you that you are my brother and sister. That is my general thinking as an elder. お互い苦しんだことを分かち合うために来て、私たちはあなた方のことを兄弟のように思って愛しています。だったらね、ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。ありがと
because I'm deaf, maybe no good looking. Nobody look at me. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise. Silent prayer. Where's my dog team? I have a lot of plane. Uranium, pure uranium on that plane. Where they converted it to atomic bomb to drop it here. I work one day. And I often thought about that. But it's not your fault. You don't know nothing. I never thought, I never thought, I thought it was gold. I thought you make rings of it or something. Eh? Uh, didn't bother him. As long as I got that twisted all, I was happy. Uh, I did that one day at all. ceremony on the banks of the River Ota brings the peace day observances to a close. Fifty-three years ago, the city became an inferno, ignited by the bomb's heat. Thousands unable to endure the pain of their burning flesh, drowned in the rivers. Poems, thoughts to family and loved ones are written on paper lanterns and set afloat to console the souls of the dead. Thank you. Do you want to see what I wrote down? I just wrote down, for all the victims who died and are suffering from the ravages of the A-bomb, and for all the Denny of Great Bear Lake, and all our ancestors who suffers, and to all the future generations to come who will also suffer. When you go down to the lake, you hear eagle flying off from a distance. And as they come closer, you can hear, hear him let out a squeal and then dive down to the water, pick up the fish and go across, sort of bounce across and then fly off. And as they fly off, you can hear the loon crying behind. <laughs> My little boy, he's four years old. He always said he missed that. He saw his daddy dying. He was really crying. I, I really do miss him. Everything I touch just reminds me of him. Just only me, I would stay all night with him. I'm really sleepy, but he said, after I die, you can sleep how long you want, so I hope you don't mind, don't sleep. So.
before he died, just knew he's going to die, so he just gave me a kiss and said goodbye, that's it. Hey.